right, this next speaker, I, I, I found in a magazine called Bitch, which I love that magazine, and I was really excited when she actually answered my email. So don't tell her that I was fangirling er earlier. Shit, she saw me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let me introduce, okay. So she is a law professor at the University of Miami School of Law. She is the legislative and tech policy director and vice president of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, a nonprofit organization dedicated to challenging online harassment and abuse. And she's also the co-producer of the documentary Hot Girls Wanted. Please welcome to the stage, Mary Ann Franks. Thanks, Lauren, very much for that introduction. Uh, not too many of my introductions have begun that way. I saw her in a magazine called Bitch, but they probably should begin that way. It's a, it's a nice way to start. Thank you all for being here. Uh, the title of my talk today is Fighting Fundamentalism. And as Lauren mentioned, the work that I do, I do some work as a law professor. I do a lot of work for the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. And a lot of what I focus on is, on the one hand, questions of online abuse and harassment. On the other hand, I also focus on questions of gun use and expanded gun laws. And so I'm a very popular person in many different circles. <laughs> and something that I've come across that I'm trying to identify and trying to make some sense of, because I think it's important, is a tendency towards fundamentalism. And fundamentalism in the sense, not just in a religious sense that I think a lot of you in this audience would know about, but in a more structural, more expanded sense that I think many of our controversies and conflicts nowadays have taken on a kind of legal character, a kind of fundamentalist character that's not necessarily religious in nature, and that that is troubling for many respects, in many respects, and that we should think about ways to identify that and to maybe problematize it a little bit. So I need to be clear, first of all, about what I mean by fundamentalism. So I'm gonna offer four basic features of fundamentalism that I think are relevant for this conversation. The first is the idea of a sacred text. Right, this is pretty common. A sacred text that is both read very selectively, that is to say we don't read all of it, we leave out the boring parts and the parts that seem kind of inconsistent, and we also tend to believe that the reading of the text is immediate and transparent, that we can look at the words and simply know exactly what they mean, and that we don't need interpretation, we don't need historical situation, we can just know what these things mean. The second feature, I would say, to define fundamentalism generally would be feelings over facts. Right? So that we think of untestable claims, people who are motivated by saying things like, this is just what I feel, I feel it very strongly, or making assertions that simply cannot be tested for their truth. In addition to that, that we take our anecdotes and our intuitions as being more important and more real and more convincing than actual data, than actual scholarship or the weight of evidence. The third feature is a sense of existential threat that the community, however it defines itself, is under attack. It's under attack constantly, and it needs to be vigilant against its enemies. And of course, what that means is the communities that are marked by fundamentalism are also marked by fear, a serious sense of fear, and of course, then, an energy that is directed at that fear, which oftentimes mistakes the real source of any harm or injury. So instead of focusing on actual harm or injury, there's a symbolic harm or energy that takes up people's focus. And the fourth feature would be propaganda. And I'm using that term in the sense that the rhetoric and the language and the way that the community speaks to, its, to each other and the members of this community are, is a heightened sense of speaking. That is, there tends to be inversions. Those people who happen to have a lot of power are portrayed as having not that much power. Those people who are very rich are seen as hardworking and maybe, maybe poor. So a lot of inversions are happening in that propaganda. And that whoever that community has decided poses the threat that is causing the community to have to be afraid becomes very vilified. So the language about the other becomes extremely heightened. It's very extreme language about whoever that other is. Now when we think of 
Religious fundamentalism, this comes pretty easily. And I say that partly as someone who was raised a Southern Baptist in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. So I'm speaking of a very specific type of fundamentalism here, not speaking in a, a deep theological sense, mostly referring to Christian fundamentalism. And again, this is a necessary oversimplification. But if we think about those four characteristics, the sacred text is obviously the Bible, and we can see how in many religious fundamentalist societies, it is read extremely selectively. There are some bits that we really like to go back to a whole lot, and there's other bits that we'd probably not want to care about all that much. But the parts that we care about, we want to say, we know exactly what they mean. The meaning cannot be disputed. They are almost written from God directly to us, and so we know exactly what they mean. There can't be any inconsistency. There is no conflict. It has a plain meaning. Feelings over facts, specifically with religious fundamentalism, God's will is the most important thing. There is this invisible design to the world. There are certain things that are simply inexplicable, or there is a nature that we cannot go against. Nature stops us from doing certain things. Again, regardless of whether or not those claims can be tested, and regardless of whether or not there are massive amounts of data that contradict our position, it doesn't matter because we believe so much in the feeling, the spirit of God's will or of nature. With regard to the third, the existential threat is to our very souls. So in the religious fundamentalist context, we are constantly under attack for our souls. And so we are driven by fear. We are always constantly looking out for the devil, for whatever conflict um, awaits us. And therefore, we direct a lot of the energy, if we are religious fundamentalists, towards those devilish sources. And those evil sources we focus on instead of material consequences, things that might actually affect our daily lives. For instance, maybe making a living wage, having adequate health care. Those are not seen as the real problems. Deep spiritual problems, a kind of abstract sense of what is evil, those are the problems. The nature of the propaganda is an us versus them, the believers against the non-believers the people who can see and the people who cannot see. And there again, you'll see inversions that people who may in fact, within a religious community, have quite a lot of wealth, have a lot of status, will portray themselves as very meek and very humble and lacking in power and influence. And those that would suggest, or criticize, possibly undermine some of the beliefs and feelings of this community are seen as real enemies possibly satanic enemies in some ways. So that you can't simply say, I disagree with a critic, but actually that critic will be sentenced to eternal damnation, that they are completely benighted. So we see that in religious fundamentalists, we're probably all familiar with some of the mechanics of how that works. Whether that's dealing with creationism, whether it's dealing with feelings about homosexuality, we can see the same structure at work over and over again. What is harder to see, I would suggest, but is nonetheless becoming more and more of a problem is what I've given the name legal fundamentalism. It's not a very sexy name. It's the best that I could come up with so far. And that is that increasingly, so many of our conflicts and controversies, our social disagreements are taking on an incredibly legalistic cast. That instead of talking about issues as being matters of disagreement or of reason, they become matters of the First Amendment. They become matters of the Second Amendment, right? So we're not talking about just policies anymore. We're not talking about cost-benefit analysis. We're not saying let's look at empirical evidence and see which one works better. We're saying our problems are constitutional. And so many people are now, instead of simply saying we have a conflict here, they're saying we have a constitutional conflict in both senses of the word, both literally in terms of our founding document, and also that it really goes to the heart of who we are, constitutional issues. So the sacred text of legal fundamentalism is the Constitution. But it's not the entire Constitution. The entire Constitution is actually a pretty interesting document, depending on which parts we're looking at. But the tendency to constitutionalize and the tendency to be a fundamentalist about the law or the legalistic interpretations tends to focus on just a few amendments. And I've mentioned them already. Really tends to revolve around the First Amendment. Free speech is so important. The right to religion, so important. Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Whereas other amendments, for instance, 
the Fourth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, all of these really interesting amendments and constitutional principles tend to just recede a little bit. And there isn't all that much reflection on how they fit together. Because if we think the Constitution is a coherent document, these pieces are supposed to fit together somewhat. They can't just all be discrete pieces of a puzzle, but very often when we're talking about legal fundamentalists, that's how it's treated. We don't pay attention to the other amendments. We don't pay attention to the underlying principles of the document. We focus on pieces. When we focus on those pieces, we insist that we, whoever the we happens to be speaking at that moment, and it doesn't have to be a lawyer and it doesn't have to be a judge, it just might be somebody on Twitter, insists that they know what the First Amendment is. It's clear. We know what free speech is. We know what the First Amendment says. I know what the Second Amendment says. And it's repeated over and over again that no one can correct this interpretation because it is felt. It is a felt interpretation. The intensity of my emotion reassures me that I know what this text means. And any of you who disagree with me do not know. Feelings over facts. So here it's not going to be God's will because we're talking about legal fundamentalism, not religious fundamentalism, but it's a sense of justice or rightness or the way things ought to be. But nonetheless, really intense for all of that. We have a feeling of justice and if we do not have the correct view, the fundamentalist view of this constitution, then we are going to be failing justice. We are failing the very social order itself. And again, many times that will rest on untestable claims and rest on anecdote and intuition that is going to trump data. And I'll give a couple of examples of that in a minute. For the third element, the existential threat. We are constantly under attack. Our rights are constantly under attack. Before you know it, our First Amendment rights will be gone. If we were to implement background checks, we would lose our Second Amendment rights. That's all it's gonna take. They are constantly under attack by everything, right? They're, everything makes us afraid. If people are saying certain things or doing certain things that we don't like, free speech hangs in the balance. If we suggest that we might need to change our regulations regarding firearms, we could lose everything. We lose our constitutional rights altogether. And of course, what that also means is tremendous amounts of energy and money, I should say, are poured into the effort to defeat this enemy, to defeat this existential threat to our rights. And that often takes the form of political lobbying, which means that it's not just money, it's also power in a quite literal sense. The money goes towards making sure that the politicians who have power are the ones who are going to ensure that our rights, our fundamental rights, are not violated. And the propaganda there is, again, just as intense. It is just as much of an us versus them mentality as we would see in religious fundamentalism. The sense in which we are going to take the most powerful, the richest, the most elite, and portray them as though they were vulnerable and fragile and at any point about to evaporate. And at the same time, to take anybody who is in fact criticizing that take on fundamental rights, that take on the Constitution, as being against America itself against the Constitution. Why do you hate freedom? <laughs> Propaganda. So it's a bit abstract, the way that I put it out there now, so I'm gonna give a couple of examples to talk about what I mean. Let's take First Amendment fundamentalism, just to take one piece of this. And let's take an issue that is going on right now, and that it's going on pretty much, I guess, since we're in Missouri right now, in our backyard. The Missouri-Yale protests, I assume a lot of people have heard about these, right? So what's going on at places like uh, Missouri and Yale? Well, the long and short of it is you have a part of the student body, specifically at Missouri and Yale, saying there, is prob there are problems with race on campus, specifically what's going on at these two universities, that some members of the student body feel that there are deep structural problems with racism that the administration has failed to address. And in Missouri, the argument was, you have had plenty of chances, they say to the administration, to address this. And at Yale, there was a, a debate over some emails that were sent around the time of Halloween that coming from one side, one part of the administration, the dean saying, it's about to be Halloween, Yale students, maybe think twice, 
I, I am uh, simplifying here, uh, maybe think twice about wearing blackface. And the suggestion there was not to say you can't wear certain things, Yale students, it was to say, think about the implications of what you're doing. And maybe a not so subtle way of also saying, after all, you are adults and you are living in a community with other reasonable adults. Think about the consequences of your action and about the kind of people you want to be. Which sparked a response from someone else in the administration who suggested that the first suggestion was censorious and it was very insulting to the student body to tell them that they shouldn't do certain things or that the student body would be so easily offended as to not be able to handle some tacky Halloween costumes. And so there have been protests also at Yale. So these are, and these are not just limited to Missouri and to Yale, there are lots of different places where this is happening. Now we can imagine lots of different conversations about what's going on at Missouri and at Yale. We could have nuanced conversations about better and worse ways to deal with grievances. We could talk about whether or not the way the rhetoric has worked so far in these universities is good or bad. We know that what ultimately happened at Missouri is that the president and the chancellor did resign. That's a pretty dramatic result. And that we could talk about whether that's a good thing or not, whether that's the best way to handle the situation or not. What has happened, I submit, though, instead, has it's become a fundamentalist issue, specifically a First Amendment fundamentalist issue. That those who are criticizing the students, and I want to make it clear that those who are criticizing the students are not just your usual suspects. It is, you will not be surprised to learn, Rush Limbaugh and the National Review, right? But it's also The Atlantic. There seems to be a convergence on the right and the left that these students do not understand the concept of free speech. That the fact of their protests and the fact of these emails that were exchanged show that students today are completely misunderstanding the importance of the First Amendment. And so for our benefit, I've put up part of the First Amendment. I've actually left out all that boring stuff about religion and left just the part about speech, just to focus on the speech part. And the reason why I've highlighted a certain part of it, the no law abridging the freedom of speech, is because my suggestion is that not only are fundamentalists looking only at the First Amendment as opposed to, again, the rest of the Constitution and how it all fits together, but even as they're looking at the First Amendment and giving it all this primacy, they are already taking just pieces of the First Amendment. So, of course, the freedom of speech part, which is easy. Freedom of speech, so if you're ever suggesting that people shouldn't say something, you hate freedom of speech. Right, that's easy. But we could also look at just the rest of the amendment. You shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. When Missouri students protest, when they come together peaceably and call for action, when yes, they may suggest resignations or something else, that's pretty much exactly what the First Amendment is describing, but that gets left out. The part that's useful here is, you don't like speech. Which speech? Ah, we're not gonna talk about that. Just this kind of speech, this, 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 this way of reading of the First Amendment is all we're going to look at. The feeling over fact, how can we see it illustrated here? Who is making the loudest noises about what's going on at Missouri and Yale are not actually the people who are at Missouri and Yale. It's a lot of pundits, it's a lot of people writing hot takes on what's going on at Missouri and Yale most of whom are not themselves students or themselves administrators or educator faculty, which is not to suggest that you have to be living in the situation to be able to speak or write about it. Of course, that's not true. But one would hope, one might expect, that there would be some feelings of humility when approaching a situation for which you are an outsider, that you would want to learn something and to give some benefit of the doubt to the parties involved if it is not something you have direct experience with. And so instead of that, instead of letting students have the benefit of the doubt, we have pundits who are telling us this is what's going on in these campuses. Really what's going on is this terrible travesty of anti-First Amendment, anti-free speech actions on the part of these students. And I don't want to hear any evidence to the contrary. I don't want to see any of the evidence of actual racial uh, problems at any of these universities because that, that's not really what I want to focus on. The existential threat that's being identified here is really the death of free speech. If these students are allowed to keep doing what they're doing, we will have no more free speech. Not exactly sure how that works, but I'm sure 
I'm sure of the intensity with which that is asserted. It is an existential threat to free speech. And the way that the propaganda tends to run on this is the faculty and administrators, we think about this normally, faculty administrators in a college community, they tend to have quite a lot of power vis-a-vis -vis the students. But if you listen to the narratives about what's going on at Missouri, suddenly the faculty administrators are these poor, helpless people being drummed out of town by these uh, students with pitchforks. So who has the power? Well, the students obviously have all the power because they're able to do things like protest. So they're powerless, subject to the tyranny of political correctness, the faculty and administrators, while the students, and I'm using all of these things that are in quotation marks I'm using because these are all things the students have been called in the mainstream media. Fascists, monsters, people who weaponize safe space. You know, when your rhetoric is here, where are you gonna go if someone were to actually do something terrible, right? They are already for protesting, for a football team refusing to play, they are fascists, they are monsters, they are weaponizing safe space. Unless you think that this is limited maybe to certain corners of the internet, to certain marginal uh, identities, think about how even just yesterday, as the world is reeling from the breaking news of the horrible attacks in Paris, many people, high profile people, very educated people, took to Twitter to talk about how this was really a message, or we really should be taking a message from the Paris attacks to address the students of Missouri and Yale. <laughs> Judith Miller, New York Times journalist. You can, you, you possibly have recognized her from such wars as Iraq. Uh, now she says, now she tweets, now maybe the whining adolescents at our universities can concentrate on something other than their need for safe spaces. It's a remarkable non sequitur to hear about a massacre in a city far away to say, you know what this really makes me think about? How awful those students at Missouri really are. This will show them they're not being massacred in Paris, so what are they complaining about? Really seems to be the implication. Again, from Judith Miller, who we consider, many people did consider, to be a very serious journalist. Second Amendment fundamentalism. That's a fun one. It's hard to pick one topic, so instead of coming up with a, with, with a, a scenario, I just put guns. <laughs> Anytime there's a conversation about guns, most recently I live in Miami, so the most recent innovation that's come out of the gun, what shall we call it, uh, the, the, the gun access proponents, that's good, right? Gun access proponents is campus carry, and it sounds pretty much what it, what it sounds like, right? You should, if you have a concealed carry permit, which in Florida most people do, you should be able to take that gun onto campuses, into classrooms, into dorms, into gyms, into counseling centers. Okay, why? Well, because it's a constitutional matter, and if you don't like campus carry, if you think there's a problem with it, I will redirect you to the Constitution of the United States. Not to all of it, though, because I'm only really interested in the Second Amendment, says the fundamentalist, and I'm only interested, actually, in part of the Second Amendment. That part, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, of course, that's the second half of the Second Amendment, the first part being all this weird, grammatically awkward uh, language about a well-regulated militia for, for which, for a long time in this country, we thought meant that's what we were talking about, a well-regulated militia. In 2008, the Supreme Court says we actually do mean individual right to bear arms. Okay. But it's interesting to note that before any of this happened, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, if you ever go visit their headquarters, and why wouldn't you, they have the motto inscribed in their building. That is to say, they have the Second Amendment inscribed as their motto, but not the whole thing. They have exactly the part that I have italicized. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's much easier that way. We should really take this approach to many things. Just cut out the parts that, that give us trouble. Okay, feeling over fact, complete, and there's really no other way to say this, complete disregard for the overwhelming evidence that shows guns do not keep people safer. That all this talk about how we need the gun for self-defense, we need the gun to protect ourselves from mass shooters, you can dwell on that one for a second, that none of this, there is overwhelming consensus on the part of people who study guns, who study mass shootings, who study firearms violence that shows 
Guns do not keep us safer. Now that is not the same thing as saying guns make us less safe or guns cause these problems. That's a different claim. But there is no evidence suggesting that the greater number of guns we have, the safer we are. And yet that fact is completely overridden by the intuition that I feel really good when I have a gun. And I'm pretty sure that if there were a mass shooter, I would take him out. And even though it has been shown repeatedly, so just to throw one statistic out there, New York Police Department, New York City Police Department, pretty well trained, pretty good with guns. Their accuracy rate when they are firing in a situation where they're being fired back upon, it's 18%. The NYPD, it's only 30% when they're not being fired upon. But I am sure that the concealed carry permit holder who has all of four hours of training in Florida, none of which actually has to include actually shooting a gun, <laughs> will do better in a mass shooter situation. What's the existential threat? This is too easy, right? Well, they're coming to take your guns. They're coming to take your guns, and I would just note here, that really does mean a lot more than it says. They're not just coming to take your guns, they're coming to take your manhood. There is an identity crisis built into the response to guns, to the way that guns are presented in this culture. And it isn't, you know, to be, to be fair, not just about literally about manhood, but about self-protection, that if you don't want a gun, if you won't use a gun, if someone takes a gun away from you, then you are utterly powerless. Therefore, gun owners, and again, I'm taking these, these are actual quotations, gun owners are an oppressed minority. They are an oppressed minority. People who favor regulations, no matter how modest those regulations might be, are fascists, it's a very popular word, gun grabbers, and my favorite, people who want women to be raped. If you don't want a woman to carry concealed on campus, you are essentially setting her up to be raped. You just want her to be raped. That was an actual headline in a column in Florida about the campus carry laws. That, those are your options. You either really want to have guns everywhere or you just want women to be raped, just choose. Propaganda. And again, not marginal figures. However we may feel about the fact that Ben Carson is in fact a candidate for the highest political office in this land, he is, and he said this, no body with bullet holes is more devastating than taking the right to arm ourselves away. It doesn't really get any more blunt than that. Again, these two things are linked. First Amendment fundamentalism and Second Amendment, fundalism, fun, uh, Second Amendment fundamentalism are linked. In their response to the Paris tragedy, not only did people take to Twitter to talk about how this is the moment where we should be criticizing Missouri student protesters, it's also the moment to say this. Imagine a theater with 10 or 15 citizens with concealed carry permits. We live in an age where evil men, when evil men have to be killed by good people. That's Newt Gingrich formerly of Congress, Speaker of the House. His response to the Paris tragedy was to think about how, oh, if only they'd had concealed carry permits. These aren't the only issues, of course. There are lots, we have so many that we could choose from. Fundamentalist skirmishes, as, I, as we could call them. The question of online harassment. As I mentioned, this is something I spend a lot of time on. We've seen that, for instance, if you are a woman with an opinion online, you are pretty much guaranteed to get threats, sexual threats, death threats. In some cases, there will be people who will be driving to your house and filming themselves as they are, coming to get you, as they tell you. They will send SWAT teams to your house pretending that there is some kind of hostage situation going on at your address. These are all things that have happened. Some of you have heard about Gamergate, which has now become almost a, a catchword for what it means to engage in an online harassment campaign against women simply because those women are entering a field where men have dominated and are making some criticisms. And then you have a, this other term that has become so popular, the social justice warriors. Those are the worst. They want social justice. <laughs> so if you have a social justice war, you must defeat it at every possible turn because they are, as it turns out in this scenario, even though they are the ones being harassed and threatened and objectified and sexualized, they are the perpetrators. They are the oppressors. And if they ever do anything so terrible as to block you on Twitter, the first thing you should call that is censorship. <laughs>
That's what it's become. It's censorship to block someone on Twitter if you are a fundamentalist. Take the issue of police brutality. What we saw there, this extraordinary moment where we saw this hashtag become a movement, this idea actually take hold across the nation that black lives matter. Because, why do we need to phrase it this way? Well, because, according to this community, it's because they haven't seemed to matter up till this point, and that if it is in fact the case that unarmed men, women, and children who are black are being gunned down by police, that is a problem, and it is a problem that we need to do something about, was met with this response. An extraordinary example of missing the point. <laughs> if all lives matter, no one would have to say black lives matter. Everybody else's lives already do matter. There's a reason to focus it on black lives because those are the lives that are being treated as though they did not matter. But that's not the worst perversion of the hashtag. Maybe this one is. Blue lives matter. You know why? Because the real problem here is that the people, the men with the badges and the guns, are powerless. They're fragile. They are at war with, under threat by, black people. By the 12-year-old boy with a toy. By the girl sitting in her desk and refusing to get up or to take away her phone. Those are the threats that police officers are saying, you see, we're under so much threat, it really should be Blue Lives Matter. Sometimes, just to make things interesting, religious and legal fundamentalism join up. You've heard of her, right, Kim Davis? <laughs> Kim Davis, we know her as the, the Kentucky County Clerk who did not want to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. We know that in the summer this year, the Supreme Court decided in Obergefell that same-sex marriage was going to be the law of the land. Okay, well that's just the Supreme Court saying it. We have higher authority here. Kim Davis says, I'm not going to sign these things. And when she's held in contempt and when she is told that she needs to comply, this is what she says. I never imagined a day like this would come where I would be asked to violate a central teaching of the scripture and of Jesus himself regarding marriage. To issue a marriage license which conflicts with God's definition of marriage, with my name affixed to the certificate, would violate my conscience. It is a heaven or hell decision. I have no animosity toward anyone, and I harbor no ill will. To me, this has never been a gay or lesbian issue. It is about marriage and God's word. There is a lot going on in this statement. <laughs> First, who is the victim here? It's not any of the same-sex couples who were denied their basic rights, even after the Supreme Court had said, you have this basic right. No, they're not the victim here. The taxpayer is not the victim who's having to pay for this entire charade. They're not the victim. Supreme Court's not the victim here, even though their order is being completely defied. The victim here is Kim Davis. She is the one who is being tormented. She never thought this day would come. She's asked to violate a central teaching of the scripture, Jesus himself regarding marriage. I must have missed this part where Jesus talked about same-sex marriage and said to the fig tree, never sign your name to a marriage license joining a same-sex couple in matrimony. So it's extraordinary. It isn't just that you have someone. Now, this is the religious and legal fundamentalism part that's combined, right? It's not just that she has her own religious beliefs. Someone who is sitting at home saying, I don't like this whole same-sex marriage thing. Okay, you don't like the whole same-sex marriage thing. But she's not sitting at home having this conversation. She is an elected public official. This is actually her job to sign these licenses, and she's saying, I'm being asked to violate the scripture. So there is actual constitutional law. There's a real constitution out there. But her insistence is that, but that's not the real text that matters. The real text that matters is the Bible. And it's not just the Bible. It's a certain piece of the Bible, which you'd have to extrapolate a lot from to even get to any type of commentary as to same-sex marriage certificates and who signs them. And you'd certainly have to skip over all that stuff about divorce. Kim Davis having been divorced, what was it, three times? Four. 
true, but then she married one of her husbands twice, so it makes up for one of those. She gets, she gets one. So we don't talk about those issues. We talk about the parts where we are sure that the Bible tells us something else. So she cannot do this because it would violate her conscience. Notice that the real issue here is her violating her own conscience has nothing to do with the law, has nothing to do with her job, has nothing to do with social order. It's just, it would make me feel really bad to do this because of my own particular thoughts about this. But for her, it is quite serious. It is a heaven or hell decision. A heaven or hell decision. She has no animosity towards anyone. That may be my favorite part. Part of this is, is also not even a willingness to take account of what you have done. It's not me who's doing this, it's God. Take it up with God if you have a problem with this. Right? Let go and let God, that's probably what is meant by that. I don't wanna face the consequences of what I'm doing, it's just what God says. I harbor no ill will, I'm not a bad person. God is, I'm not really sure how to finish that, <laughs> that phrase. But it is about marriage and it is about God's word. So this is really a frightening moment. Now, if Kim Davis had been an outlier, if she had been a spectacle for a moment, then maybe we wouldn't worry about this so much, that if it had just gone away, Kim Davis is forgotten. But as I'm sure many of you recall, when she comes out of jail after being released for serving, uh, after being serving some time for contempt because she was not filling out the certificates as she was told to do, she comes out, first of all, she's got musical accompaniment. Eye of the Tiger, that's an odd choice. Comes out to Eye of the Tiger and who's waiting for her? Republican presidential candidates are lining up to support her, to talk about how she is a martyr, to talk about how she alone has the strength of character, the godliness to stand up to this crazy world and its Supreme Court and its constitutional rights that don't involve guns and dares to, to, to do what she must do because God has told her to. So it isn't just that there's pockets of resistance, it is that an entire political establishment says this is not only acceptable, this is right, what she has done. And there is zero acknowledgement of the fact that the public and the private spheres at least nominally should be kept separate, that church and state means something, that we cannot simply slide from one to the other, from someone's personal conscience to their public duties and to their responsibilities, which they can either choose or not choose to honor based on how they feel. Not the only ones. Abortion and contraception, let's talk about that for a second. The entire hostility to abortion can be summed up as mainly two things. One is an insistence, a religious insistence, let's be clear, about when personhood actually begins. And that is not one that scientists agree on, that is not one that scholars agree upon. It is only something that certain members of a certain religious community think they understand and know with certainty. And that point has been being pushed back even farther and farther throughout history. Not even Thomas Aquinas thought that personhood started at conception. He thought it took a little bit of quickening. There are a few weeks that you had a chance, right, before the, the soul enters the body. It happens earlier for boys than for girls, I'm not really sure why, but the point being, even Thomas Aquinas didn't think that that was the case. But now, now we know that that easily makes people who are supportive of abortion into, not just people we disagree with, but murderers, murderers. And that, morality, that sense of God's will that must be so clear, that cannot be contradicted, that cannot be even argued about, is then extended to contraception. So if life begins at the moment of conception, you also can't take a lot of forms of contraception. Now that's going to be interesting to see if what that means is at every moment when a woman has a miscarriage, whether we should investigate her for manslaughter. Right? If life begins at conception, this is the world we would be living in. That is despite the fact, the fact that if we really did hate abortions, we all can say, we're really, nobody's a big fan of the abortions. We know that the single best way to reduce abortions is through contraception. So when the insistence becomes, no, no abortion, but also no contraception, this cannot be what we're after. That would be deeply incoherent. It has to be something else, and that something else has got to be inhering in 
an illogical idea, one that is about morality, one that is arbitrary, and one that is actually harming real human beings all the time. Death penalty, there again, we know that the death penalty doesn't deter people. We know that it's incredibly expensive. We know that litigation goes on for years. It hurts the families, it hurts the states. But if we have this deep religious sense that this is the only appropriate punishment for certain crimes, we can't let go of the death penalty. Even though we cannot come up with a public reason for why it's justified, we have to resort to private reasons, arbitrary reasons that are mostly based on intuition and not based in evidence. It's all pretty depressing. But it can also all be fought and is being fought all the time. There are ways, of course, to not be a fundamentalist. There are ways to fight fundamentalism. I think the first way, as with most problems, is to ensure that you identify the problem. Recognize it when you see it. These are characteristics that are playing out in many different controversies over and over again. Let's recognize them when we see them. And commit ourselves to principles and not preferences. No exceptions for just us or just the people that we know, but actually having principles that stand up to all the exceptions, all the hard cases, and really testing ourselves to see whether we really have a principle or whether we just merely prefer certain outcomes in certain situations. Committing ourselves to public reason. It is perfectly acceptable for anyone to have whatever view they want to have privately. They are welcome to be a member of religion, not be a member of a religion, to believe that abortion is murder, not believe it is, to believe that homosexuality is a sin, not believe that it's a sin. But public reason is different. Public reason needs to be accessible to all people, whether they are religious or not. They have to be public reasons that all of us, as individuals who have the capacity to reason, can have access to, even if we disagree that we at least are using the same tools to get to our conclusions. We have to use public reason. We also have to have textual comprehensiveness. It's not a very great phrase either, but it's the idea that there are no such things as sacred texts. Every text has a history. Most of them, most of the really influential ones, have a pretty terrible history. We have to be very upfront about confronting what exactly was going on in those sacred texts when they were written. Who wrote them? Who was being excluded? What was considered acceptable at the time? And that is as true for thinking about what the Bible says as it is for thinking about what does the Constitution say? Should we be fetishizing this document that was written by an extraordinarily small minority of people who did not believe that women were citizens, that did not believe that African Americans were citizens, did not believe that Native Americans were citizens. Certainly, there is deference to be paid to the fact that these are foundational documents, but there is also the consideration of their limitations. We cannot assume that any text is sacred, and we have to be alive to the possibility that whatever text is lifted up is probably suppressing other texts, and that we should be mindful of those other texts. In the context of the public sphere, in the context of legal fundamentalism, I would suggest there's one very straightforward text that has been suppressed that is not as popular as the First and the Second Amendment. And it's one that I think can actually be quite a good guiding principle in many respects when we are trying to navigate these very controversial topics and difficult conflicts that are facing us today. The 14th Amendment could be seen as the attempt to correct some of our limitations, an attempt to inject some humility into our process. If we look at what it actually promises us, that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. There's a lot packed into the 14th Amendment, and it says a lot about how we can and should think about individual autonomy, about how we should think about human dignity and privacy, and maybe most importantly, how we should think about equality. That none of these rights mean anything if they are distributed in a way that is unjust.
So if we can fight fundamentalism, we can fight it by using some of these principles, by remembering to think about the suppressed texts and the suppressed voices, and we can use all of those things to properly identify the real threats, because there are very real threats that face us today, to see what are the true threats to autonomy and dignity and equality, and to fight them accordingly. Thank you.